Hi, I'm Michelle Adabato. The North Ward Center is committed to educating the public about the importance of community programs that give all New Jersey residents a chance for a better life. That's why we're proud to support the important educational programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato at NJIT has been provided by the North Ward Center. St. Joseph's Health, a passion for healing. It's what's inside us. PSENG, committed to providing safe, reliable energy now and in the future. TD Bank, the healthcare foundation of New Jersey, founded by the Jewish community. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and by MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey. Promotional support provided by AM970, The Answer. And by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got this? Here it is, man. Look at it. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> I don't care how good you are or how good you think you are. There is always something to learn. Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Hi, this is Steve Adubato. I'm coming to you from the campus of NJIT. That's the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Why are we here? This is, in fact, the Voice Summit. Uh, sponsored by Amazon Alexa. You've got about 2,500 folks from all over the country, programmers, people involved in something called artificial intelligence, all about voice. What does voice mean in our lives today? What could and what will voice mean in our lives tomorrow? That's what the people are here talking about at NGIT at this Voice Summit. We'll be interviewing those folks and bringing everything you've ever wanted and needed to know about voice to you right now. Hey, have you heard the news? It's gonna be awful. You can't be sure whose side someone's on. If whatever happens, we all need to have our story straight. We can't let them get away with it. It's too much. We have to think about our futures. Maybe we should hear from someone with a little perspective. What do you think? Should I tell the truth or protect myself? Tell the truth. Thank you. Kevin Cornish, who's the founder of an organization called Conversive, which is? So Conversive is a conversation engine for building face-to-face -face conversations. So imagine putting a face on Alexa. In, uh, in the entertainment space, imagine having conversations with characters from your favorite shows. This is the API that allows all that to happen. API. From, yeah. What is 13 Reasons Why? So 13 Reasons Why is Netflix's biggest show. And what they wanted to do for the, to help launch the newest season was give fans a chance to step inside the world of the show. And to do that, we enabled this experience where you're getting FaceTime calls from the characters. So it's a voice first movie that's set during the show. And it treats you just like you're one of the kids on the show. OK, an 18-year-old watching the show. He or she's watching it. But then they're interacting with the show how? So the day before the show launched, there had been a whole media buildup to this new season. There had been all kinds of open-ended questions from the season before, big questions about what's going to happen in the next season. They get, they find, a, they get a link on, find it on Snapchat or in an Instagram story. They click in, then they start getting a FaceTime call from Tony, no. the star, of the, the star of the show, and Tony's telling them, "There's a lot of crazy stuff going on. Whatever happens, stay out of it." And then over the course of the next 10 minutes, they're going to be getting calls from seven, eight other characters on the show. And the decisions that they make about what to do is going to affect what the other, how the other characters respond. The level of interactivity is totally different than anything that some of us, quote, back in the day ever experienced with media. Mm -hmm. Well, if you think about everything that's happening with social media, you're at the center of the story. If you're watching Instagram, it's, all, it's as much about what are the comments and what are the comments that you're yes. getting back. It's the conversation about the conversation. But you're watching all these characters that have peripheral roles in your life. But at the end of the day, you're at the center of that story. So for big media companies, 
that are, need to be in the business of making content, how do they put their fans at the center of the story? And you see this with the obsessive fandom of, on any of the big IP, that it's, I love these characters, I love this world, I want to be in it more. What can I be doing to get deeper in, into that? How'd you get into this? So the first thing I did was a thing with Taylor Swift. And there was a moment in... She's a performer? She is a uh, <laughs> singer-songwriter. You may know her from some yes. of her early Nashville days. And she's done some good things. Okay. She's, done, she's done some so very good So what did you do things. with Taylor Swift? So I was doing a couple of videos, and then on one of the shoots, I got to shoot with a 360 camera. And this was maybe four years ago, so the technology is really early. But there was a moment where she looks in the camera and starts talking to the camera. And then watching back on the headset, it felt like she was talking to me. And this idea of having a conversation with someone that you would never be able to meet in the real world was this very inspiring thing. Because the possibilities and thinking about what is it that fans want and what is it that's important, it's this idea of I can make eye contact with somebody, I can use my voice. When I'm tapping like this, I'm, it's, it's like muscle memory, it's not human communication. Yes. And so the bonds that can be created by using my voice, making eye contact, seeing, using my mirror neurons, just ha it creates a deeper level of engagement. So one of the most fascinating things from 13 Reasons experience is that we could see who is interacting with voice and who is interacting with tap. And the people that were interacting with voice were engaged twice as long. They so, stayed on longer. Yeah, so the average time on, in the experience across the world in 17 different countries was four minutes and 45 seconds when they were using their voice. Tap. When they were tapping, two minutes and 45 seconds. What does that tell you? It means that there's, there's something else emotional happening when we're using our voice. And that it's, it's less mechanical, it's less of an automated, it's more, this is how humans have wanted to communicate for hundreds of thousands of years. Yep. And it's getting back to this it being the most you, you know, You know, you're way too young. I hate when people say that. Uh, <laughs> they don't say that to me much anymore. But you're way too young to remember what you may have read about Marshall McLuhan, mm -hmm. who said what about the message? I'm thinking the medium's the message. That's mm -hmm. exactly what you just said. I don't think Marshall right. McLuhan was thinking about voice. Right. But he was largely talking about television versus radio. But you're really saying the same thing. You're saying that the medium by which the information and the content is distributed matters as much as the content itself. Yeah. And our, our ability and our desire to engage in it and with it. Am I making too much yeah, of that? Yeah, and, and how we relate to it. That what do you mean? When we talk to each to other, we're connecting emotionally. We're creating a bond. And that when we're talking to our entertainment or talking to whatever it is that we're experiencing, we're bonding with it, okay, sorry for not just learning from it. Okay, stay on this. We're having this conversation. Yep. It's on public television, it's on Fios, it's on a lot of radio platforms. Okay, fine. Say we were to use the, the concepts you were just talking about right now. We're talking. We want to engage people watching right now. We're breaking all the walls down. Yeah. Yeah, it's this, it's the... Um... Could it work in a talk show? Absolutely. Really? Well, well, then what do I do? There is an art to asking <laughs> questions. Oh, now you're going to, after 25 years, you're going to tell me, please tell me. <laughs> well, those, the people on the other side of the screen aren't conversation artists. But how do we, here's, I don't want to belabor this, but I am curious. How do we get them, right, more engaged in this? That they play is a role playing game for them and they get to play the character of you. So think about it, think about it like this. Go ahead. You have a great conversation with somebody. You. You kind of go away, you go away from it, you remember it. Yes. What defines great conversation? When you, great questions make great conversations. Most people don't have great conversations. That they have these kind of baseline conversations, superficial, it's not really very interesting, and as a result, it's forgettable. And so they go through their lives having one conversation after another that's forgotten. But if they could step into your shoes and have the conversation the way that you would have the conversation, now all of a sudden they're having a memorable experience. And that they're remembering something, not remembering something that they saw, but remembering something that they did. They didn't just witness it, they participated in it. Exactly. And it is doable even in this venue. 
This is a, yeah, this is a great venue. It'd be prompting the questions for them and giving them a choice of questions, but it'd be a, giving them a choice of good questions. Well said. Awesome. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Be right back right after this. To watch more one on one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Dr. Yvette Wan, Assistant Professor of Informatics and Director of the Social Interaction Lab, NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. By the way, describe that title. The Social Interaction Lab is? Social Interaction Lab is uh, myself and a collection of students, and we do research related to human computer interaction, which is looking at how people interact with all sorts of different kinds of technologies that are social. Uh, so that includes social media, online games, live streaming, so a lot of fun research going on. You know what's so interesting, I, I was saying this to you before we get on the air, by the way there are thousands of people here at this Voice Summit at NJIT, um, who come, who've come here for a lot of different reasons, but I bet there are some folks watching right now, Professor, who say, oh, voice technology, less human interaction, more technological control, you say? Well, I say that, of course, there could be some doomsday scenario where voice completely takes over, but I don't really see it that way. I see it more of as a complement to human uh, interaction. And there are a lot of situations where, um, for example, when you're seeking information or something like that, where it would be nice to have someone always available all the time. And the thing with people is that it's very hard to do that. And so one example is, for example, let's say you're very uh, elderly person at home and you need to reach out to someone right away and someone is not readily available. In that case, you might want to talk to a conversational agent that may be able to assist oh, you for back something. Back up. A conversational agent. Define that. Conversational agent is basically a machine that you can have a conversation with. How does that work? Do you ask questions? Well, it can happen in, in a lot of different ways. Um, sometimes you can ask questions and it can give you answers. Uh, it really depends on the context. And so... Um, can the conversational agent drive the conversation as well? Or does the human being have to drive the conversation? Well, Meaning, I, you're, you're right. acting like I don't have to be here. Right. That you could have a conversational agent hosting this show for public television, <laughs> Fios and other platforms. Steve, we don't need you. We're gonna have a conversational agent sit right here and talk to the professor. Does it work that way? I mean, no. I, the technology isn't sophisticated enough to work that way yet. Uh, uh, currently, it's most, mostly about responding to your questions. A lot of me I often think that medical, I've used some voice technology mm -hmm. around health and medical mm -hmm. related questions. Growing area? Yes, definitely. Because? Well, um, for example, we do a lot of searching on the internet for medical reasons. And um, sometimes, uh, let's say right now, you look, up, look it up on a website and it gives you information through a text. Uh, voice would be just, it would be exactly the same thing, but instead of giving it the information to you through text, it gives you it through voice. So it's not that much different than what we're already used to right now. But stay on this though, the, the medical situation is fascinating to me. For those of you who've ever gone onto the internet to search for medical or clinical information, health related information, I'm included. What's curious to, to me, doctor, is if, if you come, People often say, well, some physicians will say, don't do that, it's dangerous. People can decide for themselves. Can you have a situation where you ask a question of this conversational agent who's an expert, or the technology is programmed for this conversational, I'll get to the question, I promise. Um, <laughs> where you ask a question, you get something, and you need clarification. Can you ask a follow-up to say, wait a minute, you just said this, I heard this before, what's accurate? Well, there are limitations of the conversational agent. It's only as good as the intelligence of the system. And we're at a very, I mean, it's getting better, but it's still at a very low level. Is it and the so, early stages? I would, say, I would say that it's still at a very, very early stage. Um, uh, if you're talking to a conversational agent, uh, right now, it, there's not a lot of interactions where you could actually have a meaningful philosophical conversation. So it's mostly geared at question and answers. And the reason why is because there are a, lot, a huge repository of questions that we already know answers to. And so that way we have these databases that um, have all these kind of uh, 
answers that sure. are pre-made answers that, 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 that the machine can deliver to you. Um, it's less social than it is informational? It's, right now, it's not very social at all. But uh, going into the future, um, if the technology becomes more sophisticated, we can imagine maybe some rudimentary conversations. And you see already a lot of that when you're answering, for example, like phone calls where they're like, press one to do yes. this, and <laughs> two to do this. That's like a very low level, yes. right? But you can imagine that getting a little bit better. It could get more sophisticated. Yes. Sorry for interrupting. Yes. By the way, we are here at the Voice Summit at NJIT. Thousands of people have come here to Newark, New Jersey. This event is sponsored by Amazon Alexa. Um, our colleagues and friends uh, uh, in the higher education community, particularly here at NJIT, have brought these folks together here on campus. Um, what is an event like this? With the folks who are here, the whole range of panel discussions, keynote speeches, all kinds of information being shared, what does it mean to an institution like NGIT for this event to be here? I mean, I think the fact that it's in Newark and at NJIT is like very symbolic for our community. Uh, we have a very strong growing research presence here at NJIT. Uh, we have something called the 2020 Vision, which is uh, investing a lot into research. And some of that research is in this voice technology. And when you think about voice technology, it's very complex because it's not just about like algorithms and computer science. There's also ethics related to what would be appropriate for the, you know, the machine to Quick know. Example. Um, so let's say that you're talking to your, your device and you're asking it about certain health conditions. A conversational agent. Yes, a conversational agent. And you're talking about some kind of sensitive health information. Well, does that stop between you and the machine? No, because some of that data goes back to the company. What about HIPAA, the federal government laws about what in medical information can and cannot be shared by the clinicians involved. Right, well that's about clinicians. So this is like a little bit of a different conversation because it's not about doctors sharing information, it's about you sharing your personal information But I don't want anyone machine. to know, doctor. Right, but then why are you talking to this agent? So usually when you're asking questions about certain sure. medical situations, then the device knows that that's something that you're interested in. And right now- it, Is that information protected? In terms of privacy? Um, that's a good question. And those, that's what one of the discussions uh, going on here is that to what extent are the companies going to save that information? You are fascinating. Your thank work you. is fascinating. And, and this conference has so many interesting aspects to it. And we thank you, uh, Dr. Yvette Wan, Assistant Professor of Informatics and Director of, social, of the Social Interaction Lab at NJIT. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you so much. Be right back right after this. To watch more one on one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Jordan Thomas, a Rhodes Scholar, a graduate of Princeton. Princeton. University, born and raised in the Ironbound section of the city, went to what high school? To University High School, Southside. You are about to embark on a fascinating, uh, very rare experience. Very few of us, very few uh, students who come from Newark, New Jersey are Rhodes Scholars. Yep. You're about to go to Oxford. Yep, sure am. Describe that. It's extremely exciting, you know, being a part of the Rhodes Network. It's a scholarship that uh, gives you fully paid tuition to study at the University of Oxford in England and uh, very flexible options for you. You, you essentially have the entire uh, course um, offerings at Oxford available to you. So I've decided in the first year, I'll study policy evaluation and get a master's in that. And then the second year, still sort of keeping my options open, but it'll probably either be an MBA or an MPP, master's in public policy. Um, and then you have other students there who are studying for doctorates, students there who are doing two-year masters rather than one-year masters. And so it's, it's essentially a network of individuals who are striving to better themselves in a way that allows them to, in line with the mission of the scholarship, fight the world's fight, right? So we all have the social impact that we want to have on the world. World, and it's part of being this network and having these opportunities available to you that allow you to do that. And so I'm just so excited to think about what I'm about to embark on and the way that I'm about to develop to really allow me to have an impact on people in the world in the way that I want to. You're also gonna be heading to Yale Law School. To Yale Law School, and so I've decided that that's part of how I wanna have my impact in the world is I wanna do it through law and policy. And so uh, in addition to applying to the Rhodes Scholarship, I decided that I wanted to go right in and apply to law school, and that was my dream school. It's the number one school in the country, so. Yeah, I'd say so. I'm a Rutgers guy, but you know, <laughs> I get it, Yale. Ironically, when I met you, it was at a conference that was being held around the corner at Rutgers. Yes. 
And Cory Booker was standing about 10, 15 feet away when I first met you. <laughs> Cory Booker, a young man who in the United, is in the United States Senate, may in fact choose to run for the presidency. Ivy League education. Right. Um, question, is he a role model for you? Absolutely. I mean, I look at what he's accomplished, very similar background. He went to Stanford undergrad, then Rhodes Scholarship at Oxford, and then Yale Law School. Uh, the only difference there is that I went to Princeton. I won't fault him for it. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, you know, I just... Yeah, like Stanford's a terrible school. Yeah. But, <laughs> but I, I look at, you know, just his his desire to better himself, right? To continue to rise up the educational ladder and to just equip himself with all the tools that he needed to then come back and serve people, which is what he did. He came to Newark, served on council, mayor, now serving uh, the nation in the serving Senate. Serving other people, big deal for you. It is, I Why? mean, that's, well, I think about the fact that I've been blessed with certain gifts, also certain opportunities in my life that allowed me to get to where I am, right? You don't, you don't become a Rhodes Scholar without a lot of help along the way, um, and so, I'm just so appreciative of all that's made this possible, and I believe that I have a responsibility to now pay it forward and give it back to my city and to other people, right? And so any way that I can try to use my talents, use my privileges and opportunities to now give other people opportunities, other people resources, I wanna do so. And that's where I get my energy. I get my energy from working with people and know that in somehow, uh, some, some way, I'm really making a tangible difference. You know, as a student of communication, someone's fascinated by it, watch other people's ability to communicate or inability to communicate. I'm curious, your communication skills, your ability to comfortably, confidently communicate on camera right now at the ripe old age of 21 comes from where? A lot of just looking at role models, looking at individuals like you who, who managed to do it and have been doing it for a long time. Individuals like you mentioned, Cory Booker. I mean, I grew up in the era of Barack Obama, who I consider to be one of the great orators and most charismatic politicians of our time. You know, I've, I've sort of set as a mission to myself to constantly think about how I can evolve, what are my weaknesses and how can I target them and try to make them strengths. And so I wasn't always as confident speaking. Uh, you were not? No, not People at all. Say, oh, he was born. Kid, great leaders, <laughs> great communicators, they're just born. No, it's just natural to them. You say? No, I was, I was extremely nervous to speak uh, in groups. Uh, I remember my first experience in public speaking. I, I had to give a, uh, a speech. It was like a, a poem that I had to read in front of the entire school at university. And university was, High. University High. And, and I was standing there in front of the entire school and I get ready to start reading and my hands start shaking and the paper starts shaking. For real? And, and then it just gets worse, right? Because it's all, it's all this psychological game, right? Where it's like, you're, you know your hands are shaking and that you start to psych yourself out. And it was just a disaster. And in that moment, I told myself, I am going to apply myself to making sure that I can now command a room. I want to speak confidently. And I started looking at who who I thought did a really great job of speaking with confidence, of articulating their thoughts well, right? I don't like to use a lot of ums. I don't like to use a lot of likes and, and these other not. fillers. Um, and so it was, it was an applied effort by me to get better at that. And I think that I that's it. what life is about. It's about finding your weaknesses and trying to make them strange. That's, I'm so fascinated by this. I mean, I, obviously I teach in the field of communication. I study it and write about it. So when someone says, this is the experience I had. Listen, you may ask why am I making a big deal about this? And I'm not gonna turn this into a Tony Robbins seminar. <laughs> but I gotta tell you something. The idea that you saw that, not so much as a weakness, but as an, but as an I call it, an opportunity to develop, right. to grow, to improve. That's a big deal. That is a sign of leadership. Thank to you. look inside and say, hey, wait a minute. I didn't do that well. Now you could have folded. Yeah. Why didn't you fold? Because that's just my mentality is I'm never going to give up. Right? I don't believe that. I think that this is when we get into these discussions about growth mindset versus fixed mindset. Right? Fixed mindset would have said, well, I'm just a terrible orator. This is I'm just a the terrible, way I am. That's just that's how I am. I can't, I can't get any better. You say? And I say, absolutely not. I'm going to work. My motto is I'm going to give everything 110%. I'm going to go that extra mile. I'm going to be the hardest worker in the room. And I don't care if you're more talented than me. If you're more gifted than me, you're not going to outwork me. And that's I where I've it. gotten where I am. And so I looked at that and I said, I don't care if you're a more naturally gifted orator, but you're not going to be a better orator in the long term because I'm going to work to outpace yeah, you. I'm going to, I'm going to throw something at you don't expect. I'm a big believer. And you grew up in one part of the city. I grew up in another let's just say not at the same time, right? <laughs> okay? But I have this crazy idea that not everyone, but a lot of folks who grew up in Newark, there's a level of toughness. I mean, I, there are other parts of this country, I'm sure people have it. Yeah. 
it's hard to it's hard to beat that person down and convince that person he or she can't keep coming back and getting better and make it. Yeah. Is that you? Oh, absolutely. I agree. Something about I, this I, city? I say that all the time is that Nork built me, right? I am where I am because of Nork, not despite Nork. And I think it's like you said, it's people in Nork have this chip on their shoulder, right? It's a chip. We, we are resilient. <laughs> and, and I think it's in line with the city, right? It's a city that's gone through tough times but we, we always believe that a better future is coming and, and we're going to work 110% to make sure that that better future does come. And so, you know, we, we operate with this mentality of you can't keep us down. We are a part of this great city. We, we've, we've been built by it, we've been shaped by it and watch out, cause here we come. You're never gonna stop trying to get better, are you? No, and as long as I have people like my parents and like so many others who continue to help me and invest in my crazy ideas, I hope that we can make a better future. They're not crazy, and by the way, you know you, I know you know this, but there's a lot of buzz about you. And particularly for those of us who are from this city, we're proud of you. Thank and you. And excited about your future, not just in terms of your own success, but what you potentially could do for other people. Thank you. Congratulations. Thanks, I appreciate it. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato at NJIT has been provided by the Northward Center, St. Joseph's Health, PSCNG, TD Bank, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and by MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Autism is one of the fastest growing developmental disorders in the U.S. Here in New Jersey, one in every 41 children is diagnosed with autism. And when a child is diagnosed with autism, every member of the family is affected. While there currently is no cure for autism, early detection and intervention can offer critical improvements for the child and tremendous benefits for the family. To learn more about autism, contact the Binder Autism Center at St. Joseph's Children's Hospital.